So in this episode, I'm going to talk about persuasion and particularly how you can be more persuasive in your everyday work. Stay tuned. You are listening to The Leadersmith, Darren Gertis. Okay, so in this episode, I'm going to be talking about persuasion, and this is built on an article that came out today in a Psychology Today magazine, Six Tools for Persuasion by Marty Nemko. Okay, so we all want to be persuasive. We all want to be more persuasive. If you're if you're at work and you have some managerial or marketing responsibility or something, you want to get things done. You want to convince others that what you're doing is something good or useful or whatever. So Dr. Nemco gives us a number of examples of how to do it, and I think he laid it out very nicely. Um, but he used it's in Psychology Today, so he used all, like psychology kind of language, and I'm going to try to convert that to. Um, examples that we can all kind of get our, our minds around and then you can use it at work or wherever you're trying to employ this these persuasion techniques. Okay, so he said, he starts off by saying whether we're speaking to a person or a group, we all want to be persuasive. Of course we do. And he said there are a number of ways that we can do this. And he has six tools. The first one is appeal to core values. And when he says appeal to core values, he said this, quote, the values could be broadly held such as merit or effort or beauty or the values you want to appeal to might be more specific to your audience. So broadly held, yeah, I mean, if you can tap into something that we all kind of agree on, you're gonna be more persuasive. We already agree, we're giving you the benefit of the doubt. Now the specific is specific to your situation, like what is your work culture, or how do people in the audience that you're speaking to, how do they see the world? And if you can tap into core values, whether they're general or specific to that culture of group, a group of people that are um, that you're appealing to, it's going to work better. So I've given this example in class for years. You can be in the Marine Corps or the Peace Corps, but you can't really cross those over very easily, right? The values, the specific values of the Marine Corps, it's probably pretty different than the specific values of the Peace Corps. So you wanna speak the same language as the people that you're trying to persuade. Now along these lines, he's saying, talk to the audience that you're trying to persuade in language that they understand, like uh, politicians. They tend to talk to their base right? They don't tend to spend a lot of time. Have you noticed this? Politicians, like if you're a Democrat, you're not spending a lot of time trying to convince the Republicans of the brilliance of your Democratic ideas and vice versa. And so they spend time talking to their base because it's that common language. Okay. Now the second one is a confirmation bias. Now this got my attention because confirmation bias, I'm thinking, wait a minute, you don't want confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is bad. Of course, confirmation bias is bad, but listen how he explains it. Now, if you don't know what confirmation bias is, um, the definition of confirmation bias is quote, the tendency to interpret new evidence as confirmation of one's existing beliefs or theories. Now you can get in trouble by having a confirmation bias by only using that information that you have to confirm what is being presented. So that can derail you or get you off track or uh, have you believe information that you really shouldn't. And so it can be a bad thing, but it can also be a good thing. And here's how. It's, he says this, quote, it's easier to persuade people to adopt your idea if you point out where it's consistent with what they're already doing. So if you're aligning or linking or uh, trying to say, well, you already believe this, so this is like that. That is a good way of linking it. Now, you gotta be careful that you're not manipulating by doing that or not leading them astray by doing that. But he, he's right in the sense of, if you can build on what they already know, that's gonna bring be a lot more persuasive than if you're really trying to jolt them and see a whole new perspective or, or talk, as the example before, as a Democrat politician to a Republican or vice versa. Okay, next he says, invoke a respected bandwagon. Okay, now that also grabbed my attention because the bandwagon effect isn't good. Here's the definition of the bandwagon effect. The bandwagon fallacy is also sometimes called the appeal to common belief or appeal to the masses because it's all about getting people to do or think something else because everybody else is doing it. Okay, so that's the bandwagon effect and you don't wanna use it to derail and get people thinking something that they shouldn't be thinking. But if you're trying to be persuasive, again, aligning or linking what we already know is not a bad idea or bad strategy as long as it's truthful and you're going the right direction with it. So let me give you a few examples. Now in the article, the author gives a psychological example uh, that 
I'm not even quite sure what he was saying. Um, so I, I think it's not supposed to resonate with the average person. It's supposed to be, I mean, it's going to the Psychology Today audience, which are probably mostly psychologists and psychiatrists. So uh, let me give you an example because he's giving a controversial issue in psychology. But I'm going to give an example on both sides of the political spectrum of controversial issues. So um, yesterday, as I'm speaking now, yesterday, uh, Derek Chauvin was um, uh, found guilty on uh, second degree murder and third degree murder and manslaughter. And there's a big divide in the country, probably just like there was with OJ, about how people are seeing what happened. Most black people uh, think that cops are out to kill them. And I saw a statistic yesterday that was just horrifying, where 80% uh, of those who voted for Joe Biden think that it is more likely that they will be that they could be killed by a police officer than in a car accident. Wow, that is significant. Now, not to diminish that feeling because I believe that they actually feel I believe that they actually see it but the statistics don't bear that out okay and we'll come back to that later now on the other side of it it's almost a mirror image of those that think that they can be that they would be likely to be killed by a police officer over a car accident uh, it's almost a mirror image if they're if they voted for Trump okay so black people who voted for Trump have almost opposite views of black people who voted for Biden on this particular issue now let's go to another example conservatives and face masks you know conservatives are much more reluctant or they push back on face masks and that kind of thing why well again it's that political thing liberals are you know they're showing their pictures with their face masks and they're it's a virtue signal for liberals to be wearing the face mask it's kind of a virtue signal for some conservatives to be not why because they're looking at political freedom not so much the disease and they're skeptical of government just like black people tend to be skeptical of police so now these are very different but now what would happen if i invoked talking to the black community, a conservative commentator, well, you know that Candace Owens says, they would laugh me out. But if I invoke somebody who they listen to and trust about that, and it's moving us the, the right direction, that is going to be helpful. Same thing on the other side with the other issue. So the next one was rhetorical jujitsu. Okay, he said, use your audience position to support your contrary position. And then he gives you another example of that um, psychological example that I'm not gonna use. But let's go and look at what I just gave with the uh, black and cops or with conservatives and face masks. In the article, he says, if you're trying to change their mind, you might say something like, you're right, it's often important to understand blank and to that end, we've generally found blank. So let's look at blacks with cops. Yes, it turns out that there's a higher uh, percentage that are killed by cops within the African-American community and the white, as opposed to the white community. But does it go as far as you fear? I mean, is it the same as the statistics for uh, accidental deaths? And then we can start to unpack it and talk about that and have a conversation. And this could work the same way with face masks. What if the governor, instead of issuing a mandate gave an example of hey look personally i think that you ought to wear face masks we know that face masks don't have a great effect on you but they have effect on others and we want to be good citizens so i'm asking you to please wear this face mask that would signal something to conservatives they're not having their rights taken away and they wouldn't be uh, so agitated about it so you can if you're trying to change people's minds you want to build on what was coming before and add to it Okay, now the last thing he said, or second to last thing was sandwich the controversial. Don't make that your last point. Make it the second to last point. Say something they agree with, then bring in that controversial thing, but also end with something that they agree with. So if you work that in, in the proper sequence, it'll be more likely to have an effect. And finally, he said, end inspiring. End with an emotional story or an appeal, but a story is going to have a very different effect than you know telling statistics or, or just trying to make a logical argument we identify with stories and stories are persuasive okay those are the six topics and if you add these and they're like legos you don't have to use each of them but if you add each of these six pieces you're much more likely to be persuasive and that brings us to the quotation for contemplation for today it comes from aesop aesop of aesop's fables aesop said persuasion is often more effectual 
than force. If I can for if I force you to do something, you could still be sitting down on the inside. But if I persuade you, you're going to voluntarily sit down because you want to, and then it's going to stick. I don't have to worry about what happens when I leave. Okay, so that's all that I have for today. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope that helps you become the kind of leader that you would want to follow. Thank you.